So, who is our opening keynote speaker? The one and only CEO of Digitally Undivided, Catherine Finney. I got this feeling inside my bones. Thank you it so much. Electric, Good morning. Come on, we're in Miami. Good morning. So great to be here with you guys today. My name is Catherine Finney, and I'm the founder and managing director of Digital Divided. And I want to talk to you today about something that's been on my mind a lot. It's what I've dedicated my whole entire life uh, to answering, and it's this question of who gets to innovate. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal story, and you'll understand why this question is so important to me. So I grew up in 1980s Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Anyone here from Milwaukee or the Midwest? OK. I forgive you. <laughs> so I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. My father was a brewery worker. He worked at a place called Schlitz Brewery. Um, oh, someone knows Schlitz. Hey, yeah, a fellow hipster is in the audience. And so uh, the brewery was like the center of the community. And it was where we had Christmas dinners, Boy Scouts. We hung out. It was the center of the community until the brewery left. And when the brewery left Milwaukee, it devastated the community. Even 30, 40 years later, the community still has yet to fully recover. And what happened in Milwaukee is no different than what's happened in Gary, Indiana, Detroit, uh, other parts of the Midwest and Pennsylvania, where you had these factories that were the center of the community, that were really the basis of the community, and left and people were left without that social fabric. But my father had this vision of himself that was bigger than what was normally allowed for a middle-aged, African-American, former brewery worker, high school dropout. And so he took a course at a place called OIC, which is the Oppor Opportunity Industrial Centers. And what OIC was, was these centers that were located across the United States that trained displaced factory workers. And they usually trained them for service jobs, working in hotels, uh, waiting staff, so forth and so on. However, there was a gentleman from IBM who decided, I am going to actually teach a group of displaced factory workers how to code. And he started a C++ which is the foundational language of, of computing. Those of you who are computer scientists know it really well. Course at OIC. And my father happened to take it, and he fell in love. To the point where in my family we often joke that C++ was the other woman in my parents' marriage. <laughs> and from there, he found his calling. He took an unpaid internship at 36, unpaid internship at 36, at IBM, and from there got an entry-level position at Digital Equipment, and from that he went to become an engineer at Microsoft, and when he passed, he was an executive at EMC. When my father got his job at Digital Equipment, he moved my family to Minneapolis, Minnesota, so I spent my later childhood and my teenage years in the mean, tough streets of Minneapolis. From Minneapolis, I went to Rutgers University. From Rutgers, I went to Yale, where I got a degree in epidemiology. I didn't get to wear cool suits like that. Um, and had this idea that I was going to dedicate my life to saving the world. I could, I could do it. And I was determined to do that until two things happened. One, I had a sick parent, and I had to come back from abroad. And last but not least, I fell in love. And so I came back to the States. Oh, that wasn't bad. We're still married. It's a good thing. <laughs> and so I came back to the States. I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I was spending a lot of time shopping. At the time, I lived in Philadelphia. I wasn't near any of my friends or family. And so I spent a lot of time at a mall and just shopping and kind of spending probably way too much money. And my husband said, you know what? Maybe instead of spending money, you could write about spending money so you don't actually have to spend money. Maybe you could start something called a blog. Now, this was in 2002. 
Um, at that time, nobody knew what blogging was. And I remember saying to my mom, hey, I'm going to start a blog. And she's like, you went to Yale for what? <laughs> like, you didn't need to go to Yale for that. Uh, and so I started this blog. It started off as a hobby. It was called The Budget Fashionista. And then in 2004, I was contacted by the Associated Press to write an article about people who traveled to go shopping. And I was like, well, that's me. And they wrote about the site, and it exploded. In 2004, those of us who can remember way back in those stone ages of the internet, there wasn't a lot of original content being created for websites. And so a lot of websites, a lot of publications, a lot of newspapers were using the Associated Press to sort of fill their content. And when the Associated Press wrote about me, that meant it went everywhere. And there was an old IBM commercial uh, that came out many years ago where it was a startup. And as soon as they put their company on the web, it starts ticking and it's like first one customer, then it's a thousand customers, then it's like a million customers. That's exactly what happened to me when it went out. It shut it down. This was pre-cloud, so Luckily for me, that person that I fell in love with and had to change my career for, he was useful. I married someone useful. Tip to everyone, marry, partner with someone useful. He was an engineer, and that meant that he could fix the site. And so we were able to really scale this into a business called The Budget Fashionista. And so I'm partially responsible for the selfie. I want to apologize to you all for helping make that possible. So it was in the middle of the budget fashionista that I was like, you know, I'm getting these great emails from these women who are starting amazing startups, like LearnVest and Rent a Runway. And, you know, I could do it too. Like, I have a platform. I know how to start things. I can do this. I marry someone useful so he can code for me and I don't have to pay him. <laughs> I could do this. So I came up with an idea to do a beauty box at that time for African-American women. Black women purchase over 50% of all healthcare, hair care products here in the United States. 50%. We're only about 6% of the US population. And so this was 2009. I'm like, I have the community. I have this idea. No one is thinking about servicing this community at all. I could do it. I'm going to do something for black women in hair. So I entered into one of the early incubator programs in New York City. And it was the first time in my life that people had no expectations of me. Not low expectations, no expectations. And it was because of my gender and my race. And that was really difficult for me. I mean, I grew up in Minneapolis. I was used to being the only black person in the room. That was like nothing new for me. But what was new was people not having any expectations of me, thinking I just couldn't do something. And that's what I was met with. And that really stuck with me because I was literally being limit limited from innovating because of my race and gender. Nothing else, had the same pedigree had a community. I remember even someone asking me, do you know of any black beauty bloggers or any black fashion bloggers? And I literally had to say, dude, I was like the first. Like, I know of a lot. But just that sense of that I wasn't really meant to be there and being made to feel that way, it just really stuck with me. So I later sold my company, and I went to go work for another woman-led organization called Blogger. Do you guys know what Blogger was? Blogger was a organization that represented millions of women social media stars. And it later sold to another company that then also later sold too. So it's part of two exits. And I got to see the impact of being a part of those exits had on me financially, but also on the finances of the founders of the startups. And I thought, why aren't there more women like myself doing this? Why can't women of color create companies? Why can't women create companies? Why are we not being allowed to innovate? So I started an organization in 2012 called Digital and Divided. And one of the founding team members is actually here, Darlene Gillard. And we started off as a series of events. Um, I just wanted to gather people who were like me in a room. I would come to amazing conferences, not like Emerge, but other conferences, where I would literally be the only 
person of color in a room of a thousand people. I would be one of like maybe two or three women in a room of a thousand people. And that was ridiculous to me. I knew that there were more of us in this space. I knew that we existed. We weren't just being invited in. So we started Digital Divided. We did a series of events from 2012 to 2014. And the most successful part of the events was this sort of virtual incubator accelerator program we had for black and Latinx women who were creating startups. And so they would come, we were partnering them with amazing mentors, and it was just a great, great time. But it kind of ended at the conference. And so we wanted to do something more. We wanted to create a true incubator accelerator program. So we went to our partners and said, hey, we had this idea, you know, it's hard out there for us to start startups. Uh, we want to create an incubator accelerator program. And they said, great, Catherine, go and do that. Um, how bad is it? And I was like, uh, you know, I don't know. So we went and Googled and researched and talked to a whole bunch of people and said, you know, exactly how many women startups are there? We just need a baseline to know. And no one could tell us. They couldn't tell us not only how many women there were, they couldn't tell us how many women of color startups there were. And so I went back and I said, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm just, this is just not gonna work. We're not gonna be able to do this program. We don't have any data. I just don't know what to do. And my husband, in his very practical way, said, He's useful. He's useful, right? That's the thing. He said, didn't you go to Yale? And didn't you go to Yale for research, right? So why don't you do it? And you know, sometimes as women, we don't look to ourselves. Like we have the answers and we often look to other people or we try to empower other people to have the answer when we have the answer ourselves. And I was like, you know what, you're right. I know how to do this. That's literally what I went to school for. And so we started Project Diane. And we, what we did with Project Diane, and we started it because we realized you can't solve a problem you can't quantify. That it was really difficult for us to pitch people on a solution when we didn't even know what the baseline of the problem was. We, didn't, we couldn't track how big of a success it was. We couldn't do any of that because we didn't have baseline data. And so what Project Diane was and does is create a snapshot, a snapshot of what is going on with black and Latinx women startups in the general space. And so we did our first uh, Project Diane in 2016. We named it after Diane Nash. Diane Nash was a civil rights hero, probably the most important civil rights hero you've never heard of. Um, complete badass, she at 19 confronted the mayor of Memphis and shamed him into getting rid of lunch counter segregation. She did this at 19. So we named it after her because we realized that there were women of color startups that existed that no one was counting. And these startups were important. They were changing our communities. They were helping scale our communities. So we counted it. It was literally started off just counting. Our first year, we focused on African-American women. We found that there were 88 black women-led startups in the United States. Not a lot out of the million startups. That has increased about five-fold since 2016, but the numbers were really low. And the report found sort of three takeaways. One, for funders, the VCs, the investors, they were investing in this thing called a pattern. And those of you who are in startups and tech, you've heard this a lot. It's sort of like, I've always invested in this person who graduated from, startup, or from Stanford, so I'm only gonna invest in people who graduate from Stanford. Or in my portfolio, the most successful companies have come from MIT, so I'm assuming that all my successful companies are gonna come from MIT. And what we were finding was that VCs were just kind of following this. However, if you were looking for black or Latina women founders, you're not gonna find them at MIT. You're not gonna find them at Harvard. In fact, a majority of black women founders come from Howard University, which is an HBCU in DC. A majority of the Latina women founders come from UCLA, which is you know, a couple of hundred miles south of Stanford. So funders, if you're looking at 
empowering and finding amazing women of color startups, you have to change your pattern. You have to look in different places. We also found for ecosystem builders that you have to create more pipelines into the space. There's very few pipelines that exist for women and women of color into the startup space. Most of the pipelines and the pathways that have been created have been created for men. And not just men, but mostly white men. And not just white men, but young white men. So even if you are a white male over 40, the current pipelines still are not made for you even. And last but not least, we also found that you want to lure them from the big cities. There's a lot of focus on New York, a lot of focus on California, but not a lot of focus on Miami or Atlanta or Chicago. These other places where great startups exist. These also happen to be places where there are large, vibrant communities of color. I know this week there's a Rise of the Rest tour happening. Um, via Revolution in the Case Foundation. That's an example of people now starting to pay attention to the places that are not just New York and California. And that's important because close to 50% of all black and Latinx women founders are located sort of on these coasts, but other places as well. So back to Digital Divided. We took that information and we created our company. And we do really three things. It's research, programs, and community. And there's a lot of things that we've learned post Project Diane. We're currently in our fourth cohort. We're in two locations in Atlanta and in Newark, New Jersey. And one of the things that I believe is really important, particularly as we try to scale this space and get more people of color, more women of color, more people of diverse ages, as we attempt to diverse this ecosystem in this entrepreneur space, there's, I think it's important that we share our learnings and what we've learned. And so we've learned three big things at DIT. One, we've learned that money is a problem, but it's not the problem. And what we mean by that is there's a tendency to just throw money at a problem and think that that's going to just change it, that we're just going to give everyone $50,000 and we're all going to be good. But what we realize is that there is some education that's needed. The startup space isn't natural for our communities. And I'll give you an example. As an African-American woman, I have been taught that you always put your best foot forward. You never put anything out that's not great. In the startup community, you don't do that. You don't, perfection is your enemy. You put it out and get feedback. And it's not gonna be great. And the first feedback is probably gonna be pretty brutal. But that's not what we're taught. And so understanding that is really important when you're building programs and you're trying to increase the pie. We also learned, and I alluded to this earlier, that the path is different for us. And this is really, really important. When we first started Big, our incubator, we used the models that existed from others. We used Y Combinator, we used 500 Startups, we used Techstars. And we used their model and we tried to apply it to our community. And what we learned rather quickly was that model was definitely not made for our community. It was not made for people who can't just leave their jobs. They don't have a safety net. For people who, is, who are the friend and family. Um, that's a joke that we have in our incubator. Many of the people in our program are actually the friend and family, so they don't have a friend or family to go to because they're the friend and family that people go to. So how do you create a program for those folks? How do you create a program for moms? I'm a mom of a three-year-old. I can't be gone you know, three weeks out of the month. So how do you create a program that allows someone like me to be able to build a company successfully while all, also still being able to be a mother and do the other things that I care about? And that's the thing that we have to ask ourselves, because again, the path wasn't created for our community. And last but not least, and I think this is one of the most important things that we learned, at the end of the day, everybody wants to live a creative life in which they control. We all want to live a life that is creative. And however we define creativity, that we control, that we embrace. 
and that entrepreneurship in tech is just a tool. It's not the end all to be all. And that was a really important lesson because in the startup and tech space, it's often the opposite. It's, you know, everyone wants to be a startup in the tech. That's the assumption is that everyone wants to have a startup, everyone wants to be in tech, and that everything else is kind of underneath that. But really, it's this sense of controlling our lives and being able to say and live the life that we want to live in the way that we want to live it. And that's the opportunity that tech and the startup world offers us. And so I want to leave you with that. I think we might have a couple of moments for a little q and A. I'm hoping that we could have a little bit. I know I have another q and A too, but we have some moments. If I, can, I can't. Can we do a couple? I'm a, I don't care. We're all friends in here. We'll, do, we'll take a couple if anyone has any like questions or thoughts. Yes. Please say your name and where you're from, because this is also a, you know, a networking opportunity for you as well. Oh, my personal journey? Um, so Anna, thank you for that. She asked, uh, what's the biggest lesson from my personal journey? And that is, you know, really being clear about what it is that I want out of life. Being really, really clear with myself. Um, I think sometimes as, as a woman, as a mom, I tend to think of everybody else, like what's best for my son, what's best for my husband, what's best for my mom, what's best for my friends, what's best for, but I never, I rarely sit down and say, what is best for me? And to understand that if I can answer that question clearly, that means that I can also answer the question of what's best for my son and my husband and my friends and my mom and everyone else. But having clarity on that is probably the biggest lesson I've learned. Thank you, that was great. Any other questions? Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm um, so happy to see you. I met you at Facebook like six months oh, ago. Oh, yeah. You gave me like a shot of uh, inspiration. My oh. name is Susie. I'm hi, Susie. I'm the founder of uh, Frequency, and that's a, an app that creates content, content based on your mood. Oh, ooh, Trying yeah. Trying to be positive. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, your cohorts in Newark and in Atlanta, yeah. I almost applied for Atlanta, but I'm oh, in Miami. Yeah. Are you thinking of doing any virtual cohorts? Yeah. That's a really great question. So we just launched a pilot this year called Big Everywhere, which is bringing our incubator program online. And so we're really, really excited about that. It's in pilot phase, and it's going to be launched bigger next year. Um, thank you, and it's great seeing you again. Any other questions? Do we have a little bit of time? Well, I'm going to be at a I think it's a VIP lounge discussion or a stage. Um, so definitely seek me out afterwards. Um, we'll be around a little bit. But it was such an honor to speak with you all today. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you. And go forth and create. Thank you.